This is Denise's dad. He passed away February 14, uh, 2019. He was a humble, gracious man who, uh, of course, we miss. He loved God. He loved people. And he's greatly missed by his family. That's Denise there, by the way. And uh, all those grandkids there that he's reading stories to, which he loved to do, are all grown up. And uh, two of them are married already. But we have a hope, we have a sure confidence that he has not gone out of, completely out of existence, but is in fact, is in the presence of God, whom he served and whom he worshipped. And so we have a sure trust that we will be able to see him again at some point, when we're also done with this life and we will be welcomed into God's presence because of our trust in Jesus. This hope and trust is very reassuring. It's very helpful to us now. And I'm sure you have loved ones of the same. But of course, not everyone believes that there is even any kind of laughter life. A group of such people came to Jesus with a question for him about the resurrection, the Sadducees. The resurrection is the coming to life again of a person after death, either here on earth, like Jesus raised a couple different people like Lazarus from the dead, or in the afterlife, either a resurrection, of a good resurrection, uh, so that you are with God, or not so good a resurrection where you'll be in hell. Now these people who questioned Jesus about their resurrection, they were not sincere, they were not inquisitive. They were looking for a way to trap him and eliminate him. They were just kind of in line with some others who were doing the same thing. So as we come to uh, Luke 20 verses uh, 27 to 40, it's probably still Sunday or Monday on the week before the Passover. It's in Jerusalem and Jesus has created a, quite a stir among the religious leaders. He's being hailed by, he, was, he has been hailed by the crowd as the king. And he was throwing merchants out of the temple area. And that gained Jesus both a positive with the normal crowd and a negative attention of the leaders. Uh, let's pick up, uh, I'm just going to read from verses 19 and 20. This is giving us a little more background. The scribes and the Pharisees sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told his parable against them, but they feared the people. Jesus had just told a parable, and it was against them. So they watched him. This is what they did. And they sent spies who pretended to be sincere, that they might catch him in something he said, so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. Now, so far, they had been unsuccessful. So when we come to chapter 20, verses 27 to 40, the leaders are still questioning him in order to try and trap him and get rid of him. They aim to challenge Jesus' authority and negate his popularity in an effort to find a reason to arrest him. But Jesus does not prove to be an easy catch, and he has confounded the scribes and the chief priests already. So the next in line to try are the Sadducees, verse 27. There came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. So we need to stop for a moment and talk about these guys. We don't see them much in scripture. And historically, there is not actually a lot about them because after the, the temple was destroyed in AD 70, they went out of existence. And you'll see why in a second. Basically, the Sadducees were an, the aristocratic class of that time. They were rich, they were born into their position, they made up the majority of what was called the Sanhedrin, the ruling council over Israel. They were the majority of those guys. They were also the ones who held the high priestly offices. Even though they may not have been from the line of Aaron, they kind of bought their way into that. Uh, and to keep those positions, they cooperated with Rome. And so, by the general population, they weren't really liked. So when the chief priests are mentioned earlier, that's these guys, it's the Sadducees. Plus, they also held other high and influential positions in the, in the land. Now, the Pharisees, we've seen a lot of them. Just to compare them, they're conservative, they're traditional, they uphold rabbinical teaching, but they also add to Scripture by doing that. The Sadducees are kind of the opposite. They're what you would call the theological liberals. They don't hold to the traditional teachings, and they tend to take away from Scripture, not completely upholding it. They were people of power and wealth who wanted to keep hold of it. And, of course, they would have been especially angered by Jesus throwing the merchants out of the temple because that was their little baby. That was their operation. 
Also, when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, that would have worried them as well as leaders. So we're told immediately of one of their distinctive beliefs. It says that they deny that there is a resurrection. In Acts 23 verse 8, we're also told there that they don't believe in angels or spirits. So that's what I mean by theological liberals. They kind of throw away some of the stuff. So they come to Jesus just like the other guys did in order to try and catch him and trap him somehow. To trap him in his words so that they could get rid of him. So that they would, he would quit interfering with uh, what they were doing. So they came up with a pretty strange hypothetical question, especially considering that they don't believe in life after death. What they believed is that when you were dead, you were dead, you were gone. The only way that you could continue was through your offspring. You had to have family and offspring and your name would continue down through the generations. That was the only way you had, quote, eternal anything. Um, it was by your name continuing through your offspring. So their question was meant to further their viewpoint and catch Jesus. So when you see their question, remember, that's what they're trying to do. So their question basically is, whose wife is she? And let's get into their, their start of the question. This is their little preamble in verse 28. And they asked him saying, a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man bro man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and, ra and raise up offspring for his brother. So they're bringing up a law from Deuteronomy 25 verses 5 and 6. And then they're proposing a hypo hypothetical question based on that law. Well, let's look at that from Deuteronomy 25. It says, if, if, brothers, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. So get that first of all. They don't want his wife to be married outside of the family. Okay? Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. Now for us in our society, this is pretty weird. You can imagine me and Denise, we don't have children and I die. Well, my brother, by if she was to follow this law, would, would have to marry her and try to have children. Okay? That would be pretty weird by our standards, right? But... What it is, it's a matter of continuing the family and continuing the inheritance. And of course, like it or not, in those days, the inheritance was passed through the male. Uh, basically, the wife kind of got stuff, but the male had to do everything. They had to be in charge and, and they were sort of the legal representative. So what, what is being done here is the brother of the deceased would marry his brother's wife in the hope that she would have a son and that son would carry the family name and keep the family property within the family. Now particularly in Israel um, when they got divided the land when they came into the land you got an inheritance of land and that was supposed to stay within your family and your tribe and so that was also part of it. So it was a practical arrangement rather than a romantic one. It was called a Leverite marriage, not kind of like the Levi Levites, but a Leverite marriage. And we see how it works out in the book of Ruth. When you read the book of Ruth, this is what's going on there. There was, there was no immediate brother uh, to, for, for her. So the next, the next nearest male relative had the responsibility. And that, that guy, and you read the book of Ruth, was by the name of Boaz. So he married Ruth and they had a son. The son was named Obed. And he carried on the family and received the family property. Obed became the father of Jesse, and Jesse became the father of David, King David. And that became the line of Messiah. That's why the book of Ruth is kind of important. But this whole Leverite marriage thing is what was going on in the book of Ruth. So now the Sadducees are referring to this law of Leverite marriage, and they wanted to see what Jesus would say about this really unlikely hypothetical situation, which they're now going to propose. So let's look at that in verse 29. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. And the second and the third took her. And likewise, all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. Now, the Sadducees who don't believe in afterlife and their resurrection are trying to mess with the mind of someone who does believe in their resurrection. Jesus taught 
of course, that you could have eternal life. There would be a resurrection. John 3.16, he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If you have eternal life, that means life after death. That means a resurrection of some kind. So, they must see, for Jesus, that this is a possible area they can catch him in. And they're working on the assumption that if there was a resurrection then somehow life must continue in the same way it does here on the earth, such as now in our marriages. They're trying to really ridicule the concept of resurrection, um, as they believe that, the, like I said, the only immortality that you could achieve was through your offspring and your name be continued that way. So they're trying to push the idea of resurrection to its limit, to make it seem ridiculous. But the question really is contrived out of ignorance. In both Matthew and Luke, uh, sorry, Matthew and Mark, Jesus adds this explanation um, before he answers the question. He says, you are wrong because you know neither the scripture nor the power of God. It was a question completely out of ignorance. They didn't know the scripture or the power of God. And of course, they really don't know what they're talking about. And they certainly don't know who they're asking. So Jesus firstly explains what the resurrection will be like for those who go to heaven. And then he was going to give scriptural proof of the resurrection. So to start with, he's going to explain uh, what the resurrection will be like, that you cannot die anymore. Verse 34. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of their resurrection. Now when you read this, this is actually pretty exciting and interesting stuff. Because in the Bible, we're not really given a lot about what heaven is going to be like. We're giving little glimpses here and there. So Jesus is answering some key stuff for us here. And it's going to, it's going to be very interesting. Jesus starts by comp comparing the sons of the age, he says, with the sons of the resurrection. Now, don't be confused by that. Sons of this age simply means anybody living here on earth. That's us right now. We're sons of this age, the age we're living in here on earth. A normal part of life for so many is to get married. People look for permanent companionship, and people want to have children and grandchildren. And these things are part of the rich, richness of life that God gives us living here on the earth. But Jesus says those who take part in the resurrection do not exist as married people. Now, without Jesus saying that explicitly, it would be pretty natural assumption for people like anybody to think, well, wouldn't we know our, you know, kind of be married in heaven? And that'd be kind of a fairly natural assumption in a lot of ways. Um, that we would continue with our spouses. I mean, God instituted marriage and blessed it. And if we're resurrected, why wouldn't that continue? Well, Jesus is clear here that marriages will not continue eternally in heaven. And he, the reason he gives here is that those who are resurrected do not die anymore. So as far as procreation goes, having offspring, there isn't any more need for it. There's no more need for that part of being married. And this addresses the Sadducees assumption that immortality comes through succeeding generations. There will be no further death. You do not go out of existence. So the resurrection refutes the whole basis behind their question. Now, as we look at the completed scripture, there's, uh, you know, the things that were written after the time of Jesus. We also see further purposes for people's existence eternally. Mainly, that is our purpose when we are, exist eternally in our resurrection is going to be primarily eternal fellowship with God himself, with Jesus. And that is even, even more important. All those who are in heaven will enjoy intimate fellowship, intimate relationship with God. And so we will not have the need of the kind of companionship we do here on earth with marriage. God's people are even called the bride of the Lamb, the bride of Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, 6 and 8. 
says, I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage, the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So you see there, the saints are the bride. And we're even said that it's going to be a marriage with the Lamb. The saints are all of God's people, not just the particularly good ones. It's all of God's people, all who belong to Jesus. And we're going to live with Jesus and the Father in heaven forever. Revelation 21, 1 to 3. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. You see all those withs? The purpose of eternal life is for his people, God's people, to be with God forever. We will have God as our intimate companion and friend. And all, all people together will worship God. Jesus isn't saying that I won't know, won't know Denise in heaven, that you won't know your wife or husband in heaven. Just that there is no marriage relationship there. It's not needed. We will have close relationship with everybody. And not just, one per, not just one person. And of course, we will have that close relationship with God himself. So at this point, I do need to back up a little bit to something Jesus said before saying no marriage in heaven. He spoke in verse 35 of those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection of the dead. Now, what does it mean to be worthy to attain? That sounds like something you have to work at and be worthy for. Does it mean that we've done enough good things in this life so that God will take us to heaven? Well, put it this way. If you can live 100% perfectly righteous in a way that pleases God your whole life without making any mistakes or disobeying God in any way at all, ever, yes, then you would be good enough on your own to be with God in heaven. Psalm 24 talks about who can go there. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? Who can be with God? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. So are you as clean and as pure and as holy as God? No, I guess not. <laughs> That's our problem though, isn't it? We don't come close to who God is. We are far, far from it. In fact, we, ought, we deliberately will do what, God, what we know God disapproves of. And that's what God calls sin. The only way to be considered worthy of God's kingdom and eternal life is the worthiness that is given to us as a gift by God. And God will give us that gift if we will trust, if we will believe in Jesus who died on the cross willingly taking the punishment for our sin upon himself and then rising from the dead so that we could be given eternal life, that we could be given a resurrection to life. Jesus said in John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Do you hear God's word that you are sinful? Are you sorry for it? And have you turned from it and trusted in Jesus for your sin, that he will forgive it? That's belief, that's faith, that's trust. And he says that you would have eternal life. The Apostle Paul even talks about all the good things he did in life. He did a lot of good stuff as far as a Jewish uh, religious leader is concerned. And he thought at the time it would gain him heaven. But he learned differently. He thought it would give him a good standing to God. And this is what he says about those supposed good works that he did in Philippians 3, 8 to 11. He says, Indeed, I count everything, all his good works, as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. 
For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. His good deeds, he says, he counts them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. There's that word attain again. Now, how was Paul attaining the resurrection? Was it through his own worthiness? No. It was through faith in Jesus. That was his whole point. And as a result of his faith, of his following in Jesus, he suffers persecution in the world. He shares in a small way the kind of suffering Jesus suffered. So we are worthy to attain to the age of the kingdom of God and the resurrection through our trust in Jesus, our faith in Jesus. And so we have to back up a little bit. There will be no more need of angels, of sorry, of ma- angels, no more need of marriage there. Marriage will not be necessary there at all. Back to Luke 20, verse 36. He said, For we cannot die anymore because we are equal to angels. Now, what on earth does it mean to be equal to angels? It simply means we will be like them in that we don't die. Angels are created spiritual beings that are not able to die. People don't become angels. People are people and angels are angels. Angels are are a separate class, if you will, of created beings that God made. And so in the way that angels can't die, we won't be able to die either. We won't be able to die anymore because we are sons of God Sons of the resurrection. Now, what in the world does it mean that we're sons of God? That sounds pretty neat. It means that those of us who have put our trust in Jesus to forgive us of our sins, God adopts us as his own children in a generic sense as sons. Don't worry that it doesn't say daughters. It's just a, it's just a generic sense of that. Romans eight fourteen to 17 says... For all of us who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. We belong to God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. In our adoption, we receive the Holy Spirit to indwell us. And he, the Holy Spirit, tells us from within us, inside us, that we belong to God, that we are his children. That we, and we can call God Father. We can literally call God Daddy. That word Abba that was there, that's the Jewish word for Daddy, with a little two-year-old or whatever would say to their father. And we can say that of God because we belong to him in that way. And we wait for the time that we're going to be with him, with our Abba in heaven. And the time that our bodies will be changed to perfect resurrected ones. Because Romans 8.23 says there, And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly and wait eagerly for our adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. When we receive that full adoption or in heaven, our bodies also will be changed our bodies will become different. Because as you get older, you realize your body is not so invincible as you thought it was, as when you were a teenager. The thought of a perfect, sinless, resurrected body literally can make us eager to get that body. Our bodies will be changed from these fleshly, dying, sinful ones into glorified, non-dying, imperishable, eternal bodies that are fit for heaven, that belong there. 1 Corinthians 15 says, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. When we die, it's perishable. It's a perishable body. But what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. That's about as much explanation as you can get for our resurrection body. But it's a pretty neat one. So Jesus paints the picture for the Sadducees and for us what the resurrection will be like. 
It's not a continuation, continuation of life on earth as the way we know it. There will be no more death. Therefore, there will be no more need for marriage, either for companionship or procreation. We will be sons, children of God, sons and daughters of God, belonging to him and with him continually. Now that's going to be the greatest thing. We will be with him continually. And along with that, our bodies are going to get changed. These fleshly dying sinful bodies will be turned into glorified ones. Now that's something to look forward to. But Jesus isn't quite done yet. He gave the correction as to what the resurrection is. Now he wants, he's going to give scriptural proof of the resurrection from a rather unlikely event, actually, from Moses and the burning bush. Jesus says that God is the God of the living. Let's look at verses 37 and 38. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush where he calls the Lord, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living for all live to him. Now the Sadducees especially like the Torah. They like the books of Moses. They, they, they think all of the Bible, all of the Old Testament was scripture, but they really, really liked the Torah the best, the books of Moses. So Jesus turns to Exodus 3, and that's where he's talking about where Moses, has, he's, uh, he's left Egypt. Um, he had to run away from there. He's running around out in the middle of nowhere, taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. And God appears to him in a bush that's burning, and yet it's not burning up. God calls Moses from that bush, and he identifies himself exactly as Jesus says here in Luke. And I'm going to just let's look at Exodus 3, 6 there. And he said, I am the God of your father and the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, this is what Jesus quoted. Now, you and I look at this and go, that doesn't say anything about resurrection. I don't get it. But Jesus points out some pretty important detail. Wording of scripture, this is just a quick aside, is not haphazard. It's not, but it's deliberate. It's vital. God is very specific, even down to the very words. God didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Notice on the screen there, I underlined the words of. God was saying he is still the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Those three who have long since died physically, Jesus said that God is the God of the living. God is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they have not gone out of existence. They live. They are with God, which means there is a resurrection, which is what he's trying to point out to the Sadducees. Then Jesus says in my Bible, for all live to him. Now, that sounds a bit confusing. Is he taking the all as in all people, all of us, or something else? Well, context, as usual, is extremely important. Who is he just talking about? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the all refers to them. The New Living Translation actually puts it in a way that's a little more understandable. It says, for they, they Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are all alive to him, to God. This just reinforces that though these men died physically, yet now they are alive with God. Now the Sadducees, and us too, when we read this phrasing in the scripture, and you see it all over the place, that I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we can, we, when we read that, we can know that God is still in relationship with these men, even right now. And we know that God is also still in relationship in the presence of those who have gone before us, like Denise's dad. Those who have gone before us, though, who have put their trust in Jesus and have been made God's sons and daughters. Verses 39 and 40. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. Well, he did speak well, didn't he? So well that those who oppose him had nothing to say. They didn't dare because they, they made them look bad. 
But Jesus is telling us clearly that this world is not all that there is. If there was no resurrection, if there was no afterlife at all, God wouldn't matter. God wouldn't make any difference. If this world is all there is, then we should just eat, drink, and be merry. Just do whatever we want. Live life only for happiness so that we can die happy because that's all there will be. Because that will be the end. But this world is not all that there is. Scripture says in Hebrews 9, 27, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. When we die, we will come before God and he will evaluate our lives. He's going to say, why should I let you into my heaven? There's only one answer that we can give. I've trusted Jesus. Now I belong to you, Father. Any other answer will have you turned away. And instead of a resurrection of life, you'll receive a resurrection of judgment. But that resurrection is not, of judgment is not necessary if we have received the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. We will not die anymore, and we will be God's children in his presence forever. We can't even imagine how incredible that's going to be. The very best of this world will be absolutely nothing. Being in God's presence will be billions of times better than that. That is something worth, worth looking forward to. That is something we can even count on. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this question from the Pharisees. Even though it was said in unbelief and trying to catch Jesus, it gave Jesus this opportunity to teach us something about what it will be like when we die, when we trust in Jesus, that we will not die again. There will be life, eternal life with you. And I thank you for that. Thank you that we can find that, find that, that, that we can be assured of that. And Father, I pray that if any don't know you, that you will help them to turn and trust you as their Savior and follow you in their lives and that they would know that they can have this kind of eternal life. Father, I just pray that whatever you have taught us, whether it's just a reassurance and a, and a, a reminder of the hope we have in you, that's great. Help us uh, remember whatever you have taught us and practice it and do it and remember that you are the Lord, that we will be with you, that we belong to you as your children. Thank you. Just, again, seal to our hearts whatever... Um, you would have us to learn. Help us to do something about it. Help us remember it and practice it. In Jesus' name, amen.